Today I'll be reading from Romans 12, chap uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 8, and it says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the pro proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy and cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. Thank you. We are busy talking about the basics of discipleship. That's where the series name comes from, Basic Discipleship. Why? Because we are a disciple-making church, and we are really clear on what a made disciple looks like. And we want to communicate to you through this series what a made disciple looks like. And we want to commu communicate it to you in a way that is empowering to you, that is inspiring to you. I mean, think about it. If you have a clear target to aim at, it gives you a lot of zest, right, in your journey of faith to actually hit that target. I mean, think about simple questions like, how do you know if you are transformed by the gospel? How do you know if you are growing as a disciple of Jesus? What should you do? How should you act? All of these are questions are really important. We have a discipleship journey for everyone at Fellowship City. This is how we explain what it means to be a disciple. Or let me say it the other way around. This is how we describe what a made disciple looks like. Let me show you a triangle. Some of you might have seen it multiple times now. Some of you might see it for the first time. Just follow me as I literally read what is on the slide. That is how simple it is supposed to be. There's something in the center. Then there are three corners. And then there are little dashes under the three corners just to explain a little bit more what we mean. A disciple loves God and loves people. Great, Reino. I'm on board with that. It comes from the Bible. How? A disciple knows God. A disciple commits faithfully. And a disciple gives generously. Okay, great. How? A disciple knows God through His Word, through encountering Him, and through worship. A disciple commits faithfully to transformation, the, uh, God's people, and the mission of the church. And a disciple gives generously of time, talents, and treasures. That is our discipleship journey. Today's sermon is all about giving generously. So the theme is simple. A disciple gives generously. But note, I'm not talking money today. I'm talking talents. Because there are three T's there. Time, talents, and treasures. So just to uh, orientate yourself, this is where we are going to spend our time today. A disciple gives generously of their talents. Last week, Lesichel spoke about committing faithfully to your own transformation. Do you guys remember that? The teaching text was Romans 1 and 2, and that's the two verses that uh, in, we find in the Bible right before today's teaching text. So let's just back up a little bit. In verse 1, Paul said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do you remember? And in verse 2, Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In today's teaching text, Paul explains what this transformation looks like. Okay, so if I present my body as a living sacrifice, if I am transformed by the renewing of my mind, what happens to me? And that's what Paul explains. Now let me give you the short answer. Paul says, if we do these things, listen up, we become a community marked by humble hearts and active service. We become a community marked by humble hearts and active service. Are you humble? Are you actively serving in and through the church community? Your answers to these questions will tell you if the gospel is transforming you. Let me pray for us before we jump in. Lord Jesus, we've made your name 
as big as we possibly can with instruments and words and singing. We have invited you to break our walls down. We have given you glory. We have told you how great you are. Our hearts are full, Father God, of your awesomeness at this moment. And that's why we open to hear from you. So I'm praying as we open up your word this morning that you'll speak to us, that you would change us, that you would transform us. I pray that you would anoint my lips, that I would only speak the words that you would want me to speak. I pray for our minds that need to be tuned in and for our hearts that need to be open, that we will be present in this place and that we will have a real encounter with you through your word this morning. I pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so question. I said we become a community of humble, serv- of humble hearts and active service. Here's your question for today. How do we grow in humility and active service? How do we grow in humility and active service? See your place in the church correctly. Give your talents generously in the church. Are you with me? Let's go. First one. See your place in the church correctly. I've got some highlights for you. Verses 3 to 5, a lot of highlights. So just read through them with me. Do not think of yourself more highly than you should. You should think sensibly. Okay, why? Because God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Okay, got it? We have many parts in one body. All parts do not have the same function. This is a hand and this is a foot. Yeah, nice one, Paul. We understand that. And in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ, and we are members of one another. The highlights will stay on, right? I just walked you through them. Do you see that God is the distributor of grace? That's very, very important. That's the place where we start. Just as in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, we are receivers. We deserved absolutely nothing from God except serious shame and judgment to death. But God didn't give that to us. God freely gave us mercy and He freely gave us grace in Christ. That's the good news. Okay? Now in the same way, we see that God continues to distribute grace in two ways. In verse 3, it's called a measure of faith. In verse 6, it's called gifts. So God is still distributing grace in the church, right? So He gave grace when Jesus died on the cross and He was resurrected from the dead. He gave us more grace by uh, pouring out His Spirit over us and now dwelling inside of us. And now He keeps on giving us grace. That's really important to see, fam. We have a Father who keeps on giving us grace every single day for as long as we live. He never stops. He never stops working. Do you know what I mean? Okay, I tried. Anyhow, so Paul says that we now have to live according to this grace. So do you guys see the pattern? God distributes, we receive, and then we live in a way that is appropriate to His design and to His calling over us. Now, Paul's first concern in this passage is that we do not think of ourselves too highly. It's called pride. And pride is a persistent sin means like, it feels like it doesn't want to go away. Pride is also a very destructive sin. It's hard to get rid of pride, and it does a lot of damage, especially in the context of community. Pride is persistent even among those who have been humbled by the gospel, right? Believers, seasoned saints, still struggle with pride. I'm not saying I'm a seasoned saint, but I am a believer, but fam, I struggle with pride. I do. And that's why Paul starts there. So the Christian is one who has been humbled, humbled enough to know that we cannot save ourselves and that we must look to someone else to save us. Any one of you who came to faith knew that before that moment of surrender, you had to confess that you are a really poor manager of your own life and that you really need Jesus and that you need His grace. Think about a child who hits the deck, right? Goes to ground and immediately start screaming and shouting for help. There's no pride there, because I'm hurt, and I need help now. Can you imagine if a child would fall and go, look, I don't want to upset anyone, but I am actually quite hurt, but I don't want people to know that I'm hurt, so I'll just tough it out. Kids don't operate that way, because kids don't struggle with pride at that age. 
We need to be like that. Prideful people never call out for help. The only people who will ever ask for help are humbled people and humble people. So as a church, we rest on the mercy and grace of God. We say that He gave us salvation. And we say we know that there's nothing in ourselves that can save us. And therefore, we should not be prideful. And yet, the church must still be aware of pride. Because even those who have been humbled can still become puffed up. This is like Paul putting up a sign. Beware of the dog. Do you guys know those signs? Hey? And then there's this ferocious dog on the sign. But it warns you, before you go into the yard, that there's something that you have to be aware of the whole time. That's what Paul does here. So Paul wants to get to how we use our talents and how we use our gifts. But he first says, beware of the dog. Beware of pride. Because pride undermines the gospel. And it destroys our ability to walk in church community. Real talk. This isn't the real talk series, but real talk. The gospel says, listen... Lay your life down for others. Pride says you're more valuable than others. Do you see it? The gospel says love one another as Christ has loved you. Pride says love yourself above all. The gospel says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Pride says other people should submit to me. The gospel says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others, right? Like Jesus, sh like Jesus showed you. Pride says, make sure that my interests are taken care of. That's a rough one for church folk, right? Look, look I just want to. <whistles> the start of that sentence is flawed already. Because it shows that your pride is turning your gaze to your own interests. Pride destroys the church. And now Paul says, see your place correctly. Okay, so where do you start? Let's look at verse 3. You are a recipient of grace. And fam, we need to see ourselves correctly because we struggle with pride. Do you know what causes pride? Comparison. And do you know how you compare yourselves to someone else? There's always someone a little bit lower than you. There's always someone worse off than you. That's how pride starts. So look, I'm not that bad because he or she is. Paul says, don't do that. Listen, that's not the way of the gospel. You need to think of yourselves with a sober judgment. Now, Paul doesn't say the antidote to thinking of yourselves too highly is thinking of yourselves too lowly. No, Paul says, think of yourself correctly, accurately, and truly. And how is that? Well, he says, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Like that is how you think of yourself correctly, accurately, and truly. Think about it like this. Let's say we take the church grounds, and we divide up the church ground, and we assign a piece of the church ground to everyone. Will everyone get a piece? Absolutely. Absolutely. Will everyone get the same piece? Absolutely not. Some will get a portion of the whole. Some will get a portion of Club 21. Some will get a portion of the parking lot. Some will get a portion of Knucky. And in that way, I can continue. Each one gets his part. The question is, what did you get? And that is then how you view yourself accurately. So there's no one that's better than the other. There's no one that's bigger than the other. They are just different ones. And they are all unique. So if I was dealt a portion of the parking lot, the way that I deem myself correctly is I am part of the parking lot. That's what God gave to me. That's what He distributed to me. Do you see that? Not I am worse off than that person or better off than that person. This is what God gave me. And that is how I deem myself correctly. Do you see that? Okay. Now, how does this help us to think of ourselves correctly? On the one hand, it says that we, uh, everything we have is from God. So it guards us from pride. I mean, think about it. The person in the hall enjoying the shade, laughing at the person in the parking lot 
in the sun is prideful because the person in the hall got the piece of all from God anyway. Do you see that? So it guards us from pride. But then on the other hand, it also helps us to uh, understand that we are not worthless, but that God has chosen in His goodness and in His grace to give each one of us a measure of faith because He loves us. Does it make sense? Are you guys with me? Okay. Now let's look at verse 4 and 5. So he says, you are a recipient of grace, cool, but you are also a member of the body. Now the analogy Paul uses here is a very simple analogy. And he says, a body is one body, but it has many members or many parts. Makes sense? I just illustrated that with a hand and a foot. Paul uses a similar analogy in the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 12. He uses a similar analogy in Ephesians chapter 4. And the reason why he keeps on using this analogy is because it works, fam. Because this analogy drives home a point, and that is that we are diverse, unified, and dependent, all at the same time. Do you guys see it? Okay, so diversity. He says we are many. We look different. And I mean... That goes without saying, right? We come from different places, we have different experiences, and we have different giftings. So there is a plurality among us, and there's a diversity among us. So we are more than one, and we are different, right? Do you see that? One hand, two hands. One foot, two feet. Do you see it? One back, one head, two ears, one mouth. So there's more than one, but they're still distinctively different. It also explains unity among us, right? So think about it. Even though we are diverse, all of these different parts form a whole. And that whole has a unifying center, and that is Christ. Okay. If this arm didn't play with, and this leg didn't play with, this brain will keep on saying to this arm and this leg, keep moving in the direction that I want you to go, but it won't which means that I won't be able to move the way that I wish to move. Does that make sense? So like, I can hammer it out with this leg and with this arm, but I'll be dragging this part of my body along the whole time because this body isn't listening to the unifying, oh, this part of my body isn't listening to the unifying center in my head, which is my brain. Well, it's actually back here, the stem. So we are unified, but we are unified around one thing, and that is Christ. Kuliso just said that. We are a gospel-centered church. So even though we are very different and very diverse and very beautiful, we are unified, but we're not unified around anything else than Jesus. And that's very important for us to hear, fam. Why? Because Jesus is the only thing that will stand the test of time to keep the unity between us. Think about it. The Springboks did phenomenal in Partly unifying people just around the sport and around that event, stronger together. And then they said, let's invoke the spirit of Sia and we get behind Temba and the boys. And then the Proteas lost in the semi-final and then everyone goes, okay. And then they carry on about their business. Because there's nothing to be unified around anymore. Because the final is being played now and we're not in it. So it doesn't last. Do you see what I mean? I'm not dissing the Proteas, by the way. I was there and agonizing for the win. Age, income level, social background, possessions, hobbies, race, social acceptability, education level, the neighborhood you live in, none of these can unify you forever, forever, ever, forever, ever. It can't. And it never will. But there's one thing that can unify us, and that is Christ and Christ alone. And we belong to that body. And we've been given a privilege to play a part in that body. Do you guys see it? Okay, so diversity, unity, and then dependence. So Paul wants us to see as recipients of different measures of faith and different gifts that we are put in a unique position. All of us bring something to the table, listen, but none of us has it all. Think of my earlier example of dividing up this plot of land. Okay, cool. Now think of a puzzle. If I have all the puzzle pieces and I divide them all up amongst you, 
everyone brings something to the table, but no one has the full picture. Do you guys see it? That's how it works when we are members of one body. Which means if you don't bring your peace, we'll never see the full picture. Do you guys know that frustration? Building a puzzle and then there are pieces missing? Oh, it's devastating! Especially if you deem yourself to be an achiever. You know, someone that wants to tick off some lists. Oh, it's, it's bad, bad. Because you look at it and you go, it's not complete. I can't tick it off. Something is missing here. Now, in exactly the same way, we are all participating in the same faith, but none of us are complete without the other. That's the church, fam. So there's a unity, there's a diversity, and together those create a dependence on one another. We need one another. Okay, cool? This one might shock you. Not only do we need one another, look at the scripture, we belong to one another. Know what I mean? Members of one another. Do you see that? That's more than just doing things together. That speaks to being together. So we are members of Christ's body, yeah, cool, but we're also members of one another. Which means that each member has an interest in the other member's journey and faithfulness, and vice versa. Do you know what happens in the church? The moment I show concern for you, and the moment I ask a question to you, do you know how mostly people answer you? That's none of your business. Oh, no, no, uh, it actually, it, it's a lot of my business. Because we are part of the same body. And we are actually members of one another. So my business is your business. And your business is my business. And your business is not none of my business. That is a lie of the enemy dividing us and keeping us from one another. Think about it, fam. If we are this body that needs to be together in dependence, unity, and diversity, where is the place where the enemy will hit us? He'll hit us in unity, and he'll create disunity. And the moment he creates disunity, you have this picture of one side that's lame and one side that's working, and the church is dragging along and actually not moving along in the way that the church is supposed to be. Many members, one body, together. Okay. Real talk. Fam, you cannot try to live the Christian life apart from the church. I said it last week, and I'm going to say it to you again. You need to participate in the life of the church. There are no such things as a solo Christian. Can you imagine? This is a gory scene, okay? I don't mean to trigger any of you. Can you imagine if we would sever my foot now in this place? And I would put my foot here. And the foot would stay there. Do you think that foot will have a life? That foot's going to rot and die. And I'm really going to struggle because I'm less a foot. That's a Christian who thinks that they can live the Christian life alone. You can't, fam. It's impossible. Unless you want to rot and die and not have a life at all. That's a lie in this world we live in because we've got podcasts, videos, and resources. I'm good on my own. Like me and Jesus are fine. That doesn't exist. I, it's actually not in my notes, but let me say it again. Can you imagine what a friendship would look like with me if you say to me, you really like me, but you really don't like Marie? So if we can spend time together, but Marie's not there, that'll be really great. She's my bride. We are one and two, two and one. Same thing. So if you dislike her, but you like me, something's wrong with your heart because we're one. And you can't have me without having her. But unfortunately, that's how Christians live. Like Jesus and I are good. You're actually not good. You just don't have someone to tell you that you're not good. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem. And also, I think there's a, there's a danger in wanting to be part of the body but not belonging to the other members. Like, I'll pitch and I'll be here but don't come too close. There's a danger there because then no one will ever come close enough so that you have a mirror that you can look into that can help you in this journey of faith. We need to see our place correctly. We're recipients of grace and 
We are members of a body. Are you guys with me? Right, let's tackle the second point. How do we grow in humility and active service? Give your talents generously in the church. Okay, look at the slide. Grace given to us. Cool, we've covered that. Different gifts, we've covered that. Look at the highlight and think of a rugby referee. Use it now, nine, use it. It's right there. Everyone can see the ball. You have to swing, otherwise you're going to lose it. Do you see it? Use it. Use it again. And then there's a specific way in which you use it. Do you see it? Generosity, diligence, cheerfulness. It should be a joyful experience to use your gifts. Do you see it? Okay. Let's keep this slide on for now, Rudolf. We'll navigate to the next one when I actually describe the gifts. One body, many members, varied gifts. And now, in the rest of this passage, Paul explains what they are and how we should use them. Now, I want you to see that the root of this particular word for gifts is grace, right? Charisma. Charis is the Greek word for grace. So these are grace gifts. Do you see it? You can't buy them. You can't train up for them. You can't study for them. Uh, Kuliso alluded to that when he uh, spoke in question of the day about there's some things that you can learn and some things that are just given to you. Now, this is given to you. They're not all the same, but we are all called to use them faithfully. Okay. So now, Paul gives a few examples of some of the gifts that we might find in the context of the church and how to use them faithfully. Okay? So there are other similar lists to this one. If you're a Bible nerd, 1 Corinthians 12, you should go and read that. And then also 1 Peter chapter 4, you should go and read that. They have some of the same words, but they aren't exactly the same as this one. Now the reason why I'm saying that is because this list isn't an exhaustive list. It's a representative list. A list. Do you guys understand that? This passage isn't all there is to say about gifts of the Spirit in the church. Not at all. But it does say something about the gifts of the Spirit in the church. Are you guys with me? Okay? So this sermon isn't the only thing we can ever talk about serving in the church. We just took this passage that followed on last week's passage. Secondly, if you don't see yourself in any of these that I'll unpack just now, that's okay. Because there are more gifts than these. Do you guys see it? Okay. The point is, find out what God has gifted you to do by His grace and go and do it. That's really important. Okay. Can I have the next slide, please? So you'll see that the highlights are changing. Let's count them. Prophecy, one. Service, two. Teaching, three. Exhorting, four. Giving, five. Leading, six. Showing mercy, seven. Okay, so seven gifts that Paul mentions in this section of Scripture. And we are called, as Christians, to give these talents generously in the church. Okay, so what are they? I'm going to show them to you one by one. Let's talk about prophecy. There's a definition of prophecy for you. Once again, once again, listen, listen. This isn't everything there is to say about prophecy, but it's a great start. Okay, here we go. Prophecy is inspired speech. It's word given by the Spirit and not consciously formulated by the mind. It's spontaneous and it's unstructured immediacy of inspiration. That's prophecy. Okay? Prophecy builds up the church. Prophecy benefits the church in the way that it brings encouragement, fam. It brings consolation, right? Comfort. It also brings fresh revelation. Oh, wow, I, I never thought about it that way. I never saw it in that light. Thank you for sharing that. Now I see anew. And prophecy also brings humbling self-knowledge to the individual and to the church. Think about a prophet this way. A prophet sees what we see, and then all of a sudden, whoo, they see something completely different. That comes from God. And then when that picture is taken away from them, or that feeling or that discernment is taken away from them, 
They can't unsee it. And then they respond. Do you guys see it? So prophecy is not when one sits and journals and draws graphs on boards and does some study and references some literature. Prophecy is spontaneous and unstructured immediacy of inspiration. The prophet sees what the rest of us do not see. And then the prophet speaks. And like I said, it can bring consolation and comfort. God has not forsaken you. He is with you. I saw Him holding you. I saw Him calling out to you. I saw Him preparing a place for you. Are you guys feeling That brings great comfort. The prophet sometimes might look at something that we face and go, this is wrong, and here's the reasons why this is wrong. Fresh revelation. Whoa, we never thought about that. And the prophet can also humble you by saying, Chiami, you are wrong. <laughs> That's also what the prophet does. What a great gift. It's a hard gift in that sense. Because you get in people's business. And you get in a church's business. A prophet in this church could stand up and go, we're not busy with the right things. God showed me that our vision is misaligned with His will. We need to get back on our knees and pray this thing through. That's what a prophet does. It's humbling. It's humbling. Gentle prophets might go, hmm, I'm sensing something here. Tell me, what's going on inside? <laughs> That's the same way of saying you sin and repent. It's just a little bit soft. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that prophecy. Now, how does one prophesy? Look at the sentence. Use it according to the proportion of one's faith. What does that mean? That means you trust God for prophecy. That's what it means. It means that you can't make these things up. You have to be properly dependent on God and you have to rely on Him to give you the words. Because without Him giving you words, prophecy cannot happen. That's prophecy. Does it help you? Let's look at service. In verse 7, if service, use it in service. Now, the word that Paul uses for service here is interesting. You guys remember, the New Testament is written in Greek. Paul writes in Greek. And in the same uh, principle as with any language, how people use a word in different contexts will help you to understand the meaning of it. Right? So Paul uses this word specifically in other places. But the way he uses it here in Romans means Various kinds of ad hoc service or regular acts of ministry undertaken by the same persons. Do you know what service is? Service is saying, play me coach. That's it. Service says, put me in coach. I've got hands and I've got feet. What can I do? Like whatever there is to do, what can I do? Will you please bribe me for the kids' club because we want the kids of this neighborhood to eat? I can bribe. Yes, that's service. Do you see it? Do you mind distribu distributing some food to people who need food so they can receive daily bread? I have hands that can pick up a box. I have a car that can drive. Yes, put me in coach. That's service. Will you help set up the building for a Sunday service? But do you see how Paul uh, uh, handles all of these things in the same breath? So prophecy is a lot different than service, but service means put me in. Let's look at teaching. What does teaching mean in this context? Teaching means insight and interpretation into the Bible and our confession of faith. Teaching is explaining to someone how it works. Do you guys remember that show on the Discovery Channel? Back, back in the day, how it works. I used to love taking the DSTV remote and pressing I to see what are they going to explain. Because I'm not necessarily interested in everything. 
But if they would show like platinum mining, how it works, woo, this is going to be great. Because they take you step by step and they give you insight and they interpret the things that you see. Do you guys see that? That's teaching of the Bible. So we preach from the Bible. What does it mean? That's the job of teaching. We say, we affirm Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He was the propitiation. We are justified. We are sanctified, etc. What does that mean? That's the job of the teacher. is to give you insight and interpretation into the Bible and our confessions of faith. Now, in the same way that the prophet is very dependent on God to give the words, the teacher is also very dependent on the Spirit for this insight. And very dependent for the insight into the significance of this thing. So I'm busy teaching at the moment. I didn't just take the verses, divided them up, used all my Bible nerd knowledge, and then compiled a sermon. I had to figure out, independence from God, what does this mean to Fellowship City now, at the end of the year in 2023? Like, what is its significance to you and to this church now? Teaching preserves continuity. You need teaching. It's like eating, right? You have to eat until the day you die. Teaching is the same. So you confess your faith, and you grow in your faith, and you receive God's Holy Spirit. All of those moments are life-giving moments. What keeps you alive is teaching. What's the difference between prophecy and teaching? Prophecy gives life, right? Prophecy brings the moment of revelation. Teaching keeps you alive and keeps you fed. Do you see that? Okay. Let's look at exhortation. I might shout now. I'm just warning you. Look at exhortation. It says, To call aloud right next to you, to argue for you by your side, and to argue against opposition. Right next to you, in close proximity. Cheering you on and encouraging you. Keep going. Do not give up. Keep trusting. Keep reading. Keep learning. I'm arguing for you. Do you see that? I'm encouraging you. This happened on Friday. Katie, our youngest, she swam in the school swimming gala. And uh, backstroke is her thing. And she did really well in the beginning of the race. So I was on the stands watching the race, going, Go, Kates, go, Kates, go, Kates, moi, Kates, moi, Kates. And Marie was at the end of the swimming lane taking a video. And about two thirds in, I saw that Katie was struggling. And three quarters in, she stopped. And it was, it was an impulse. I just leapt from the pavilion and I was right next to the pool. Let's go, Katie! Yes, so now, man, you're in my blom. Hold on, hold on. Stoot him now. Yes, Kates, yes, Kates. Come on! That's exhortation. Do you see the difference? I was in the stands. Go, Katie. Go, Katie. This is way more intense. I was in there. Yes, it was a great moment. <laughs> she, she, with that small body, she actually won her heat. It was phenomenal. And you can hear me coming in on the video. Yes, guys. Yes, guys. Yes. I didn't think that I was going to be that parent, but I am. But do you see exhortation? It's to argue for you by your side. You were destined for this. You were called for this. You were created for this. God saved you. His grace is sufficient for you. He will not forsake you. Let's keep going. And it's not only arguing for, it's also arguing against. Do not listen to the voice of the enemy. Do not listen to your boss who talks down to you. Do not listen to your divisive family member. Do not listen to the proud person gossiping about you. That is not who you are. Forget them and keep your eye on the prize. Do you see it? That's exhortation. I'm a comrade's athlete. There are people next to the road that intentionally wants to diss you. I mean, there are a lot of people who are really great. Go on, uh, nice one, booty, my booty, you're looking so well, let's keep going. And then there are people making really snide remarks. Do you know how you get past those people? It's because the next people tell you, forget about them and keep going. That's exhortation. Giving, let's look at giving. The word giving here means 
giving a share of or sharing. It means, in this context, sharing your food, your wealth, and your possessions. Do you know what giving is? Giving is this. Oh, do you need some of this? There you go. That's giving. And why? Because God gave it to you in the first place. Do you see it? So because I am relying on God to keep on giving to me, then I can hold it really loosely. I've got food now. It's not because I'm cool. It's because God gave me food. And you need food. So there you go. There's some of my food. I'm not worried about where I'll get my next food because God gave it to me the previous time and He will do it again. Do you see it? That's what giving means, fam. Giving doesn't mean sizing up all your finances, crunching a spreadsheet, creating a formula, and then paying it to the cent, and that's the sum total of it. Giving means I have, you need, there you go. That's giving. And do you see that Paul says, when you give, you have to do it generously. Generously means without restraint. It means that you've got eight slices of pizza, you're busy chowing one, and then you give whatever this person needs. Instead of going, okay, if you give me probably ten minutes, I'll be able to finish another seven, and then I'll give you one. Is that all right? That's not generous. Generosity means God gave it, I'm giving it again. That is generosity. And do you guys see that it's a gift? Now that doesn't mean that if you don't have that gift, you shouldn't give. It just means that some of us would be gifted in an exceptional way to give and to hold on to possessions loosely. Let's look at leadership. Because Paul says here in verse uh, 8, leading with diligence. Here's leadership in the church context. How simple is that? Do you guys know how many shelves in a bookstore has got leadership books on it? I had to, I had to crunch it hard <laughs> to come up with a one-liner. There you go. That's leading in the church. Going first. Championing something that the community needs. Hey, our community needs people to teach the kids. Okay, I'll go. And then you champion that cause. And then you don't champion that cause half-heartedly. You champion that cause with diligence. Do you guys know what the word diligence is in Greek? So, it's interesting. It's zest. Yeah. You guys know if you taste something and it's zesty, what does it mean? It's undeniable. Like, it's there. I want to start mentioning different kinds of food now, but I know we're very close to lunch, so I'm not going to do it. But you know if you taste something and there's something zesty in there, it's undeniable. That's leadership in the church. So someone goes first, someone champions something, and everyone knows that person is the leader of that thing. That's leadership in the church. Because you do it with diligence. You do it with zeal. Zeal is also a good biblical word, but zest is a better Z for me. It's a gift. It's a gift. And many times, you enter into leadership by feeling the urge to go first. That's how you lead something in the church. Like, it seems like no one else is going to take it. I'm going to take it. Let's go. Acts of mercy. We're almost done. Acts of mercy. Tend the sick. Relieve the poor. Care for the aged and disabled. That's what it meant in Paul's time when he wrote this letter. Now let me blow your brain. Do you guys see that he uses the word showing mercy? This is the only place in all of Paul's writings where mercy is something that is shown by humans and not by God. Fascinating, right? What does that mean, fam? That means take on the character of God. Do what God does. God shows mercy to the least of these. Now do it yourself. And do it with cheerful hearts. Hearts that say, I get to do this. Not I have to do this. I get to do this. That's acts of mercy. Seven gifts in this portion of Romans. How are we doing? 
Is it enlightening to you guys? Are you learning something here? Trying my best at teaching, right? Trying my best, yeah. I said earlier that if you don't bring it to the party, the puzzle will always be incomplete. Fam, if we fail to use our gifts to serve the church and to serve the kingdom, no one will ever see the full picture. And you also won't see the full picture of church. That's why it's so important. And like I said earlier, that's not my gifting is not a legitimate excuse to not do it. For some people, it might just come a little bit easier. So if you are serving nowhere and you want a place to serve and you're not sure what your gifting is, there's still stuff that you can start with. Definitely. Not only do we sometimes fail to use our own gifts, I think this is a big one and this will be my last point. I think sometimes we fail to receive other people's gifts. And I also think that we fail to celebrate other people's gifts because we are biased towards certain gifts. Unfortunately, and that's only pride. But if a prophet speaks into your life, listen. Receive it. Don't shun it. If we thank the people who stack the chairs and who pack the chairs, pack, stack, which one is it? Pack, stack, <laughs> then let's celebrate that gift because it is still a gift. So it's not only about you playing. It's about you allowing others to also play. And we shouldn't be partial in that. Okay, let me show you a picture. This is a passive body. It's still a body going nowhere. Now look, I know the gent needs to rest, right? I'm not saying that someone who naps is wrong. I'm just saying, let's take a look. Child. Not moving. That is not the church. Do you see the picture? That is not the church. And I'm not a prophet, but I will tell you that that is where the evil one has the church at the moment. Fast, fast asleep. Do you know what the church should look like? The church should look like this. Tete Morena Dijana. Two times comrades winner. Look at that body, fam. Active, conditioned, tuned, well-trained, well-nourished, lean. That's a body that's winning. That's what the church is supposed to be. A active, well-trained, lean unity winning some stuff. That's who we're supposed to be. And that's what we dream at this church. We say, everyone plays. We long to be a church like this. Action time. Let's say, you and Jay can come up, please. On this table, there's a QR code. On the slide there, there's also a QR code for you. If you scan that QR code, it's going to ask you for your name and your number. And then it's going to ask you, well, then there's actually just three input boxes. The one says, I don't know what my talent or gift is and I want to discover it. The other one says, I know what it is and I want to serve. And then there's a simple box that says, if you know what your gift is and you want to serve, where do you want to serve? Simple. Simple. We can't hear the word of God calling us to respond and then not respond. So that is our response moment for today. Scan it. If you don't complete the form now, that's fine, but at least it's open in your browser. We want to be a body that is active, that are recipients of grace, and that use our gifts for the nourishment of the church and the advance of God's kingdom. I want to pray for you. So let's, let's take a moment and breathe. Are you someone that wants to discover your gift and use it? Are you someone that knows your gift and you feel compelled today to start using it? Are you someone that struggles with pride? Are you someone that struggles to receive other people's gifts? Are you someone who struggles to be part of a body, to be a member of a body? 
If any of those had a yes from you now, let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, the warning is clear and the gospel is clear to us today. We see the beware of pride sign, we do. And we know that we should be, be beware of it because we are recipients of grace. Solidify that truth in our hearts for all of us who struggle with pride and who think of ourselves more highly. Thank you for making us part of a body. Thank you for giving us other members with whom we can function. I pray, Father God, if there's something there that stifles our participation in your body, that you would remove it so that we can become an active body going forward, living into the purposes you had for us. I pray for everyone who wants to discover their gift, that they will listen closely as they discover it, that they would have the discernment to know it comes from you. And I pray for everyone who signed up, Lord Jesus, that you would help them to do it diligently, cheerful, and generously. May we be a church of disciples who give generously of our talents. We pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.